All right, good morning. We have authors James Rizone and authors Cap Daniel coming to you live from Florida. So how are you doing today, Cap? Fantastic. How are you this morning, James? I am loving life. Mm. I'm out of my wonderful lanai. I've got birds chirping behind me, beautiful weather. What could I complain about? Not a bad way to start the morning. I'm just north of Panama City, and we have the same here. Just a perfect morning. Yeah, I like it. I like your background, how you got it set up with your bookshelf with just stacks of your, your books there. That's Thank a you. really slick background. We try to keep plenty of stock of the paperbacks. Um, we use them primarily for promotional items. I do a lot of signings and uh, we send a lot of copies out. Um, That's so. pretty cool. I want to ask you some more questions about that. But first, one of the main things we like to talk about on these specific interviews is discovering who the author is before they became a writer. Because uh -huh. All these interviews talk about you as a writer, your books, craft stories. What I kind of like to find out is who is who is Cap Daniels? How did you know, like where did you grow up? What was your first job? How did you become the person you are today? Well, that's an interesting way to start an interview. Typically, uh, everyone wants to talk about our books first, but I like this concept. Um, went, uh, I was raised in East Tennessee. My father was a retired Navy chief petty officer. So I think that may be the genesis of my love of storytelling. All Navy chiefs have great stories. So sitting at his feet as a child and listening to the incredible stories that he told from his travels around the world <clears throat> through the forties, fifties and sixties. And, uh, as, uh, as Navy personnel, the stories they bring home are rarely true, but they're always fascinating. So that was a, a great genesis for a storytelling career. Um, I left, uh, left right after school, uh, to join the air force and, uh, did nine years of service. And uh, now I, I still currently work full-time for the U S department of defense, but my writing has become uh, also a full-time endeavor. Yep. Um, pr prior to beginning writing what I would call full-time, we ran a charter service. We did sailing, uh, sailing charters, uh, ran scuba diving charters, uh, taught scuba diving for several years and taught many people to sail. So it's, uh, time on the water and experiences in and around marinas and on the water, meeting those personalities has sort of led to the characters in my books from the time I spent in the military, coupled with the uh, personalities we meet on and around the water, which are so unique. When you combine those two aspects, uh, you get to create some pretty exciting characters uh, because in both of those fields, both the military and uh, in marinas, you meet some, some characters who are uh, a little different than the rest of the normal world, as they say. You certainly do. That you do. You meet a lot of really interesting characters. So when you were in the Air Force, what was your specific uh, job and specialty? Uh, I was an engineer, uh, civil engineers for the Air Force, and uh, that's been a lifetime ago. Uh, Work uh, where you assigned to those uh, Red Horse units? Uh, for a bit. Uh, civil engineering most of the time, and then Red Horse for a while. Okay. Gosh, that was a lifetime ago. That's 30 years ago. I'm now... Uh, an, air traffic controller for the Department of Defense for uh, a little while longer. I'm approaching retirement quickly, so writing will become uh, my only full-time gig uh, very soon. So air traffic controller, though, that has got to be a very stressful job, I imagine. Uh, it can be. We learn to manage it over the career, and those who learn to manage it become successful and reach retirement. Those who do not uh, move on and do something else. But it's, <laughs> a, it's a thoroughly enjoyable and fascinating craft to undertake and it, it's enjoyable the personalities we meet in that field they're, they're quite interesting as well i've been a lifelong aviation enthusiast <clears throat> excuse me i learned to fly in the mid 1980s in east tennessee so i've been flying for 35 years um, been an active participant in the aviation world for well over half my life so uh, my career fits that nicely yeah now when did you decide i want to take the plunge to become a writer and physically put you know pen to paper keep, keep fingers, keyboards. Sure. I had an English teacher in high school <clears throat> who encouraged me to write. Uh, we, like everyone else, we were forced to write essays and short stories and uh, creative writing tasks in high school. And uh, there was one uh, English teacher who took particular interest in something I had written and she encouraged me to write more. And that sort of sparked a fire in me to believe that I could tell stories that others would want to enjoy. So I've loved writing for uh, 40 years. And it just became a full-time passion about uh, five years ago. And now it is something I do every day. Uh, part of every day of my life, uh, two to six hours or so, uh, is taken up with my writing. And I absolutely love the craft of storytelling. And yep. would never want to do anything else. 
yeah, I find myself doing the exact same thing. For me, I started writing as a form of PTSD therapy when I got back from Iraq. Um, and then uh, it just kind of continued doing that. And for me, it's been very, uh, it's kind of cathartic and relaxing to just be able to do that, to spin stories. And, and um, I heard someone a long time ago say, write the kind of books you want to read. Oh, yeah. absolutely. And so that's what I do. I, I was always fascinated with um, some of the military thrillers that uh, like, um, well, yeah, the Tom, yeah, Tom Clancy with his stuff from back in the 80s and early 90s was really cool. Um, and then um, Harry Turtle Dove was one of my favorite guys for like alternate history stuff he used to do at the military. Um, and I love reading some of those kind of, kinds of things. Um, Ian Slater, he had his you know, stuff in the 1990s. But what I saw was there just wasn't anyone kind of bringing those same level of stories into the 21st century. Right. So that's when I was like, well, heck, I'll just jump in and do that because nobody else is doing it. <laughs> you know, it's taken off pretty successfully that way. But um, So that's pretty neat. Now, one of the things I noticed with your books, now you have taken the, the route of going wide with yours as opposed to staying Kindle Unlimited. When did you make that decision and what caused you to make that decision? Because most Actually, often... Actually, we've stayed, uh, we're exclusive with Amazon, <clears throat> except for the paperbacks. For our eBooks, we are exclusive with Amazon okay. and we love Kindle Unlimited. Kindle Unlimited right. represents about 65% of our income. So okay. I'm, I never plan to leave uh, Kindle Unlimited. I'm very I, happy with the yeah, service Amazon. I think I noticed that on the, the paperback, I think it was, where there yes. was. Yes, uh, the paperbacks are wide. And okay. the paperbacks represent such a small percentage of the total sales that uh, we get to have a little fun with those and spread them around. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, it, but, but the eBooks are so valuable in Kindle Unlimited. There's no reason to step outside that at this point in our career. Maybe in the future we might consider it, but for now I have no plans to leave. Yeah. I've thought about that myself because there was a time where KU was 38% of my sales. Now it's up to 52%. So we did some price adjustments on ours and I'm always a big believer. Got to test the price, test, test, test the price. Oh, absolutely. As you may think that two ninety nine or four ninety nine is your cap, and the reality is it could be five ninety nine or six ninety nine. Sure. And I found that when we we tested it for two years at five ninety nine, never lost any sales or pre orders. And then when we bumped it up to six ninety nine again, we saw maybe a slight decrease in sales, but it more than made up for in the revenue difference. Um, so it's been kind of interesting. But I, I'm always kind of leery though with uh, the KU because. Um, as much as I like it, I don't like it transitioning to being greater than 53, 55% of your income because the challenge is we only, we make substantially less on KU. Oh, um, certainly we do. Absolutely. And that's my point because I think Wayne Stinnett, he switched over to going wide now. Yeah. And I was actually quite surprised he did that because I saw, I, I got to think Wayne was crushing it in KU. And to walk away from that level of uh, revenue had to be really compelling and tough. It certainly had to be. He and I've had a lot of discussions about that. And uh, he wrestled with that decision for about a year. And yeah. uh, I was surprised that he actually took the jump. Um, I, I'm, I don't know if it's a lack of bravery on my part that I won't do it, but I'm, I'm so enjoying the Kindle Unlimited revenue that, that to me, it's, it's okay. not reasonable to walk away from it at this point. Yeah. And I've got three little kids, so I've got to think about, you know, the family of, you know, being a provider and being able to take care of everyone and looking at that and saying, eh, I don't know if I could quite do that. But I, I tell you what, though, I'm really curious to, to talk and watch Wayne and see how he does it, though, because I think that when we have about a year to year and a half worth of data of him having done it, it'll be a good indicator of whether or not a, an established KU author can do that. Right. Wayne has been a trendsetter in, in our genre for a long time. <clears throat> he and I write similar type stories. They're ocean based and water based action adventure novels. And um, so he and I have a similar audience and I have uh, sort of used him as a, a teller of fortunes, I suppose. Uh, what Wayne does that works, I try to follow in his footsteps. Um, yeah. he, he says the same thing about Randy Wayne White, uh, who we all know Randy writes some of the most amazing uh, nautical action adventure since we lost John D. McDonald. But uh, in, that, in that line of hierarchy, um, those are some of the giants in our field. And to be able to watch those guys, having been successful before me, 
and <clears throat> I don't want to ride their coattails, but certainly there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. No. If it works for them, uh, if as long as we're producing quality stories, there's no reason the model will not work for us as well. Yeah, it's been the same on my end with the military thrillers. I mean, there's no reason to try to, uh, I mean, and I don't want to say we're, like we try to, re everyone wants to replicate Clancy. And, you know, right. when, uh, Clancy had a, hit a couple very good military thriller books that he wrote, The Red Storm Rising and Hunt for Red October. Certainly. A couple others. But, there, you know, he, he's passed on. And if you look at his last, a lot of his uh, last 10 years worth of work, it was it was a real lot of the, the Jack Ryan series. Right. Which, exceptionally well, but those aren't exactly military thrillers either. No, they're not. Um, they're geopolitical thrillers. Yeah, and so it's different. Uh, and there hasn't really been anyone to pick up the military thriller mantle. We've got, you know, Dale Brown does some pretty good right. stuff with his, but he's trad pub. It's only one book a year. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh. You know, <laughs> I can't survive on one book a year. My writing pace is a little, little greater than that. I know. When I was in Chicago, I work, used to work at the. I worked for Aon Insurance uh, as a cyber insurance broker, and so I'd take the train in every day to uh, the city, uh, down to the downtown, to the lakefront, to the Aon Center, and um, you know I had a two-hour commute one way each day, and that was my read time. You know that was my time to sit and just read my Kindle. I was burning through probably like three, four books a, a month, you know, with a commute with four-hour commute, um, but that was. That's when I like to scarf up books, just sit and read, read, read. Yeah. I think anyone who writes well <clears throat> was a voracious reader, at least before he began writing. Uh, in order to do, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> in order to do any craft well, we have to appreciate the craft. If we're going to paint, we have to appreciate others' paintings. Uh, for those of us who write, we have to have been a connoisseur of others' writing before we can show the craft the respect that it deserves first of all and then to create stories that our, our readers are going to enjoy without that appreciation for the art and for the craft we're never going to develop stories that are going to be marketable and enjoyable for our audience yeah yeah exactly and it's all about creating that compelling story i don't know if you uh tapped into this yet but i tapped into uh, masterclass.com several years oh ago. yes i love masterclass yeah, and so I'll sit and listen to Baldacci and Brown talk about the you know the art of seduction because when you're writing a book, it really is about seducing the reader and sucking them into the story. Oh, absolutely. Keeping them in there and that pacing. The right. First, that first part of the paragraph has got to just suck them in, and then the last part of the paragraph is going to be like, ah, I got to know what's happening. Right. Uh, I call myself a character development author. I don't write stories. I write characters. The story occurs around the characters we create. And if I can make a reader have a passionate reaction to, a, to one of my characters, I have succeeded. I don't care how they feel about my characters. I just want them to feel something they did not choose to feel. You can love them, hate them, lust for them. Uh, you can despise them. Just feel something for the characters. I never want blank vanilla characters that cause no reaction. I always want uh, my readers to fall in love or fall in hate with, uh, with my characters. And if I can do that, I feel like I've been successful in uh, certainly in the character creation portion of the writing. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And the character development is something that I continue to try to strive on. My, my wife co-writes with me. And so she uh, is constantly trying to help me do that because I'm very good with the story. And what I like to do is I, I probably, I probably take the opposite tactic of what you do. I write very plot driven store narrative stories with characters to support the plot and push the plot along. And sure. all of our stories, when, when you look at them are in a way, almost like warning stories. Like this is kind of like what could happen. They're very much of the what if right. happens. You know, when you look at the red storm rising series, it's about what if a war started between Ukraine and Russia and then how that spread to Korea and then to China and how everyone says, you know, this is the time to dethrone the United States. It's in a very precarious situation. This is the time to make the move. And so it's kind of one of those, you know, warnings of, you know, don't ever let your guard down type things. Right. You know, even with this one here, it's about how, how easy it is using technology and social media to generate a term called fake outrage, to generate oh, fake certainly. You know, where we have a scene where we have a, a terrorist attack take place on, on, on U.S. soil, but we had it videotaped, you know, with a camera uh, several different ways. And then you caption the video 
with different uh, headlines, and then you you feed that into different types of groups on uh, on social media, sure. with different audiences, and you generate fake outrage. It's right. all about that manipulation, and it's like that. It's it's incredible how easy it is to do in technology. It truly, and life is about perspective. Uh, we all see every event that occurs from a different perspective, and how we choose to react to those events from from our perspective is what defines our character, in my opinion. Uh, yep. If we are easily inflamed by propaganda, we we may not have the depth of character we would like to have. Uh, I like to believe that uh, we should look at things more deeply than than what we see on the surface. One of the large aspects that that remains constant in my writing is things are rarely as they appear. And we use all of these little tricks, these red herring. We try to lead our re readers away, <clears throat> and then bring them back at the end. But that is that has become so common in American politics and American news broadcasting that uh, there's so much garbage out there that is designed to inflame our, a reaction that yep. uh, that is not how the world should work. In my opinion, we should, uh, we should receive honest information that we can process ourselves. We're not, um, we're not limited intellect country. We have the ability to think and rationalize. Yep. And uh, when we are spoon fed information and then told how we are supposed to react to that information, I think that is uh, that's disrespectful of our uh, intellect. It is. We're smart enough that we can make those decisions on our own if we're given honest um, information that, that uh, we can we can decide for ourselves, in my opinion. I 100% agree. And, you know, I wrote this this book. I wrote this series back uh, in, I started writing it in uh, the fall of 17, and I don't know, fall of 18. And I was writing it really as like a cautionary tale of, you know, sure. if as a nation we aren't careful, and we aren't careful and mindful of what we're doing and what's happening to us or what's being pushed on us, you know, this is the reality and it's, it's not what you want to have happen. <laughs> oh no, certainly not. You know, I think that may be a concept that, that may have been started in modern time by Tom Clancy with his uh, sum of all fears concept. Yes, yes, exactly. I loved that book. That was an incredible book. And so that was kind of like a big driver for coming up with this kind of a concept sure. because it's like, well, what could you do next, you know? And so we have a new series coming out in the fall, uh, in the fall called the Monroe Doctrine. And oh. uh, people know what the Monroe Doctrine is. It's really about the United States dominating and saying, here's our sphere of influence. Nobody else is going to come in. Right. And, you know, we have, I know a lot of people have read up or know about the, what's called the, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, the, mm -hmm. uh, how that particular program works. Um, and Basically, the you know the Chinese are smart. They're not they're not idiots. And what they're looking to do is they have this giant manufacturing facility, and the United States is right now their number one customer. But they don't want that to be the number one forever. So they're taking hundreds of billions of dollars and they're investing in buying and in, in modernizing ports and railroad junctions uh -huh. and bridges and other infrastructure in developing countries around the world and in other countries all over. And it's creating a, a, a water, land, and digital belt and road initiative between the Chinese factories and the global consumer. And so they're taking these things all over. And what they do is they have a company called Costco comes in and they put in uh, a new port or a new railroad or a new, you know, a new infrastructure. But they take 51% ownership stake. So they have oh. stake in the entire nation's ports. Um, and that's how they're able to exert their influence and control on foreign policies, on, on decisions that leaders may or may not make because they control the ports. Sure. And that's terrifying regardless of the nation who's doing it, Absolutely. regardless of their politics. Anyone who's practicing that level of control worldwide is terrifying. Of course. And so they've been putting that in for a long time. So our next series is really uh, revolving around uh, the whole Monroe Doctrine concept of you know, the, the Chinese coming in with the, the Belt and Road Initiative into Central and South America and then essentially exerting that control in the U.S. saying, uh, this Monroe Doctrine is still alive and well. <laughs> yeah, <Right. there> you <laughs> <go>. <laughs> and I think a, a realistic real world example of that may be the Panama Canal. It is. Oh. Yes. The Chinese have actually taken over a majority ownership stake in the vast majority of the ports the, the containers, uh, the companies, everything down there in Panama right now. That is probably the most valuable waterway on the planet. It is. But you know, an interesting one that people don't realize is Cuba. 
So Cuba is an impoverished nation that needs a lot of resources, needs a lot of money, because the United States has this moratorium on offshore drilling outside of, around uh, Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, there's several Chinese firms now that are setting up shop in Cuba, and they're going to set up offshore rigs off the coast of Florida, uh, managed and run by Chinese firms operating out of Cuba. Mm -hmm. I think that's an absolutely horrible idea because there's no <laughs> regulations, there's no U.S. laws governing it, there's no EPA to protect it. And if we have a spiller problem, good luck. <laughs> right, right. We have no authority over. We no authority over it. Over we, an operation like that. We ceded that authority to uh, to foreigners because we didn't want to manage and run it ourselves. Right. You know, that mm. was a terrible idea. So you know, the Chinese have taken a heavy interest in Cuba. They've taken a heavy interest in Venezuela because uh, Venezuela, despite all its problems, has the world's largest oil deposit. It does. Uh, and it's not cheap. It's not bad oil. It's actually the very high grade, high end oil. Ah. And then they've also got some uh, rare earth minerals that haven't been exploited as well. So between the Russians and the Chinese, they're both very, very interested in that particular country. So certainly it makes for a wonderful series to tell. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> I love to base um, my stories in reality. Um, yes. <clears throat> I wrote a story last, uh, I guess the story released earlier this year about the Russian spy ship that we found off the coast of South Carolina last year. And I wrote an entire book based around that ship. Um, I heard about it, read a news article about that, that particular ship. And I thought, Oh, this is a, you know, this is a spy novelist dream to have a, a Russian spy ship 20 miles off our coast. What could get better than that? So uh, we, we got to write an entire story around that. And it was, it was a lot of fun to use modern day uh, actual news and create a fictional story around that. And so those things are, are enjoyable and a lot of fun to play with. We have um, our minds get out of control as writers sometimes, and we need need things to do uh, with our brain. So we get to do uh, interesting things like that with with real events, and it makes our job a lot of fun. It does, and it makes it almost easier too because when you're oh, it does. putting um, fiction and reality together like that, it's like the reader can't tell the difference, and it's right. so much more fun. It's so much more enjoyable. You wake up in the morning, you go, man. I'm excited to get back to writing today. And oh, I always am. Feeling in the world. Sure. And fiction very often is easier to believe than reality. If we look at the world right now with the pandemic, uh, who, who could have ever predicted anything of this magnitude happening worldwide? And certainly not here in America. I but, know. Uh, we, we couldn't come up with anything this bizarre. Oh, I know. I've this. been in quarantine with three kids under seven. <laughs> I know. It's been brutal. Lost my child care. My wife's having to homeschool our kids. I had to hire wow. a editors to take her place essentially. And she's having to train them because she's not gonna be able to go back to work. <laughs> so. Oh my gosh. That is uh, it certainly changed the, the American economic landscape for now. And I hope we recover quickly. Things seem to be yeah. opening back up again and uh, hopefully that the world will return to normal if there is such a thing as normal. I hope so. You know, we, it comes back to, we, we have to accept that so when I was in the military, I learned that there's two, two major things that help you help anyone get through a tough spot. One, you have to learn to accept the things you can control, the things you can control, mm -hmm. and let go of the things you can't. And right. you've got to do that. And then the other thing is when you're in a like when you're in just the worst worst moment of your life, the worst worst physical thing happening to you in your life, you have to make your world small. You know, oh, like, absolutely. I was in Iraq, man. It was it was 18 hours a day of interrogating terrorists. I mean, it just sucked. And you know, just the worst people in the world you have to go in, the things you got to see, the things you got to hear, and then you got to try and extract information from this guy. And then you get rockets and bombs falling on you all right. through the time, like all day long. It's just awful. And, you know, the only way I could get through it sometimes is, okay, it's 9 a.m. I just have to make it through to lunch. Right. Just gotta get through this one more interrogation. I gotta get this information from him. I gotta get this, this, and this. Just gotta do that. Then when I, that would be done. I'm like, okay, I've got two more interrogations. <laughs> this, this, and this, and I've got to make it through to dinner. And it was like that every day. <laughs> that, that's not how we should spend our lives, in my opinion. No, we, no. We no. have to learn to compartmentalize those things. Yeah, and, we uh, you gotta bring celebrate the good things in our life, absolutely, because it's so easy to get bogged down in the minutia of of daily requirements. And for me, writing has been the best therapy I've ever experienced. It's the most cathartic experience of my life to be able to sit down and dissolve into this fictional world 
that I get to create. And I, I don't know how you write. I, we, we all like to believe we create the world in which we write, but mine sort of comes to me. I'm, I'm a pantser. I write entirely by the seat of my pants with absolutely no outline. I never know what the next word in the sentence is going to be. And I certainly never know how the story is going to end. So to me, that's a, it's an immersion process. I get to sit down every day and disappear into this world that wouldn't exist without my keyboard. And it's so much fun. It's a, such a great escape from the minutia of reality. And uh, it is. that's what I want my readers to be able to do when, when they pick up my book, I want to take them into the same world I experienced when I was creating the story. And that's ultimately the goal. I think of most writers, we want to give our readers an escape from the reality that they must endure and give them one that they have an option of enduring or enjoying. Absolutely. That is so key to be able to do that. And I, I'm a pantser myself. I have an idea of the start and I have an idea of the end and then how I get there is right. just, you know, as a story develops, it, it moves along like that. But you're right. It is so cathartic. And for me, it was, you know, like I started writing as PTSD therapy uh, and it's been just great ever since then, because I think what, what happens is a lot of guys who get PTSD, the VA is good at giving us medication that helps help deal with Certainly. it, help handle it. The problem I'll tell you is the medication makes it very difficult to be able to function as a normal adult and be able to hold a nine to five job. <laughs> I mean, I've got a master's from, a master's from the Oxford Business School, so I think I'm a pretty smart guy. And I've worked in, you know, uh, you know senior VP level positions for Fortune 500 companies, you know, positions that pay you, you know, 135, 140 grand or more a year. So these aren't small level positions. Right. Uh, when I'm taking the, the, the medication that they would give, it makes it almost impossible to work those kinds of, of jobs of and whatnot. And writing allows me to work around good and bad days. Certainly. And, and it makes it great. And one of the things I've been trying to do is, is help other uh, vets get into doing that, especially right. if you struggle with PTSD, because this is a great way to earn a living and support your family while working around a problem that normally would put you in poverty. Oh, um, certainly. certainly. It's, been a, it's been an awesome experience. <clears throat> and even if they never sell a story or sell a book, just therapy, just the therapy of sitting down and writing the story, creating characters that did not exist prior to you typing them. That is a, it's an incredibly powerful position for the human mind to believe that we're capable of creating worlds and, and characters that never existed. And it's great for our mind, I believe, uh, to be able to, to overcome those demons. My wife and I wrote a book, in fact, called We Were Brave. And uh, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about the program that, we're, that uh, you put together later yep. for, uh, that uh, we're going to release later this year. I'm excited to be part of that. And this is We Were Brave. It is actually a story about a, um, a combat veteran who was a, a combat helicopter pilot. Um, and this will appear in, uh, in the collection that you're putting together later this year. <clears throat> this is a story of the redemption of a man who suffered from the most severe PTSD imaginable. Um, and it's a fun little story and it was great uh, therapy for me to get to create a character who suffered so badly and then overcame the, uh, the demons that he had to wrestle with for most of his life. Uh, and many of them related to his military service and, uh, the loss of the lives of those he loved around him and some yeah. terrible decisions he made, um, as a result of those, uh, those traumas that he faced. But, uh, there is an opportunity to recover and to deal with, uh, I suppose that may be a misstatement. Recovery is not always possible. Management, I believe, is most often possible. Yeah. Uh, many of the things uh, we see and hear and experience in uh, times of war, we never completely recover from those. However, we do have the opportunity to learn to manage them and deal with them and still function in society uh, while dancing with those demons in our head. And uh, any tools that we can create or find to help us do that, um, that's a necessity. Our war fighters are the most valuable asset this country has without those guys uh, and those young ladies, we would not be the free nation. We are And uh, my series, the chase Fulton novel series is based around American covert operatives and the guys who put their, their lives on the line every day in the shadows in the darkness. We never hear their names. We never see their faces, but uh, they are a, a huge part of the reason we're a free country and we get to enjoy these incredible, uh, freedoms that we have that other nations don't have. And we do those uh, because of the blood, sweat, and sacrifices of these brave young men and women who will go out and do the things that are unimaginable. And they bring demons home with them that uh, we could never fathom. 
uh, and anything that we can do to help them and tools that we can help them uh, use to overcome and manage um, these, these terrible psychological conditions they bring home. Uh, these are valuable assets to America and they are human beings. We need them and we love them and we should treat them with, with deep respect and do everything possible to, to make them, to help give them the best quality of life imaginable. I yeah. got on a soapbox there. I apologize for that. No, but that's good. But I think, you know, a lot of people seem to forget that we only have about 3% of the American population actually joins the military. Right. And of that 3%, half of them come from military families. Right. So when you would think about it, it's really only about one to one and a half percent of the American population truly actually serves in the military and has a connection with it. And so most Americans have no connection to the military or anyone that's in it. And it, it, it's kind of disturbing because they don't understand that what's going on. They don't understand the sacrifice these guys made. You know, like you and I were talking, I spent, when I first got married, my wife and I were together for a year and then we were gone for three and a half years. You know, wow. First, we were gone three and a half of our first five years of marriage uh, before I got out of the military. And that's just, that's just how it is though. Right. You know, and that's tough on a, a young marriage. Mm -hmm. It's tough on people. And it's, it I, I remember distinctly in 2007, um, my, most of my unit had left, uh, me and, and, and I think a dozen guys had to stick around one more day and it was last day of Ramadan and that's the night of power. Of course. And, uh, that's when the Mahdi is supposed to come down and smite all the infidels. And so the Iraqis, that's their one day. It's like 4th of July on an American base. They right. bought the hell out of you. And so we're sitting there, it's like two in the morning, my flight's at five. They're bombing the crap out of us. I mean, we're getting hit for like 30 minutes. I'm sitting in this bomb shelter thinking to myself, Holy crap, I am less than three hours away from getting on a plane out of this place. So I'm going to get killed or get, or get injured. <laughs> sure, my last hour's in country and I'm last not going to make it home. And then, I, then it, it goes away and three hours later, I'm jumping on the C-130 out of, that, out of that place. And I'm like, holy crap, I've made it. And five hours after that C-130 ride, I'm sitting in a pool in Ali al Salim in Kuwait, thinking to myself, how surreal is this that <laughs> nine hours ago I was getting you know, bombed. Now I'm floating in a pool in Kuwait. And then literally, it's just not joking, 48 hours after getting bombed like that, I am, I'm with my wife back here in Florida, walking around the Brandon Mall going, <laughs> how is this possible? That that's, a, that's a dichotomy. It's just, it blows your mind. Your, your, your brain just can't register that kind of stuff. Sometimes. It's like, and everyone's walking around like it's perfectly normal and there's nothing going on in the world. They're just clueless that, you know, two days before all this crap went down, I was sitting in a bunker hoping I was going to get blown up in my last few hours in Iran. Right. I mean, it's just. <laughs> and that's a relatively new phenomenon. Uh, the ability to travel hundreds of miles per hour has created that scenario. Uh, that didn't happen a hundred years ago. Our, our war fighters would stay for months and months and months with no hope of being home in 24 hours. Well, they and now it, it's complete. common. I wish, right. I wish we did that because like even in Vietnam, when they would come home, they still had like three or four months of their service before they were discharged. And so, you know, it was like duty or whatever they were doing on the base. But the point is they had some time to decompress. And sure. for those of us coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, there was no time. You literally left country and you were on a plane right back to the States to your base. And then you were come in, you sign into the base and then boom, you're on two weeks R and R. And it's like no decompression time. I mean, that two weeks R and R at home is decompression time, but what there needs to be is a decompression time before you're released to your family. An acclimation period, certainly. Yes, to, an acclimation to period. plunge from the psychology of warfare back into what most people consider normal life is a tremendous shock. It's like yep. pouring hot water on a cold windshield. Uh, yep. Something is going to crack. And yeah. uh, when we expose our warfighters to those stresses, that there's no way to prepare for those. You can't be trained to deal with that sort of psychological shock. But yeah. to plunge back into normal society, having been bombed 24 hours ago, that is, uh, that's something that, that most people could never fathom. And, and no one is equipped to deal with that. 
you no, know, it's you, you, you aren't. And it's, and it's tough because, you know, so I had that situation there where me and my wife were walking around the mall just to check, some, you know, go to get something to eat and, and, and shop for something. And then, but, you know, like five days before all of that was the last time I did an interrogation. So I hadn't even been done interrogating for a week. And, you know, my mind still focused on my cases. I'm still focused on, you know, where is this next cell? How do we get this? How do we do that? And, you know, I would go to sleep at night just, and in my dreams, I would be reliving an interrogation and thinking, holy crap, I forgot to ask this question. I need to call that prisoner back and ask this question. Oh, wow. What if I had asked this question differently? Those three guys wouldn't have gotten killed. Um, you know, and you do that over and over all the time like that. That was rough. And when I came home, man, that was a hard adjustment because I was just, you know, wanting to do that, wanting to keep going after that because I knew all this stuff and I wanted to keep after that mission. But, you know, it was. And those demons will dance in your head for for the remainder of your life. They simply don't leave. Um, They don't leave. You've got to figure out how do you, how do you rationalize the conversations with them and just be like, okay, well, you're right, but this is over. This time is over and it's time to move on. And, you know, I struggle with that still. I have, you know, good days and bad days, more good days than bad days now. Um, but, you know, it, it still can be quite a, quite a challenge. Um, oh, certainly. But it makes for some great writing. I mean, I, I'm oh, it does. pretty real. You'll see the interrogation stuff. You're getting into the rig right now. You're going to come into a few more chapters. You're going to start seeing some of those interrogation things. I'm seeing. excited to read those. I love to read a writer's niche. Um, yeah. I'm a sailor and scuba diver. When I write sailing scenes and diving scenes, and I've, as I said earlier, I've been flying for well over half my life. So when I write a scene in the cockpit, that's why I'm most alive. And I believe that is the most, pa- those are the most passionate elements of my writing. The things I love and the things I know well, um, very much like your interrogation scenes. Those are the things that you can actually feel rather than create. Those are outpourings of what you know and feel. We have one in every single one of the books as our you know, guy, Colonel Seth Miller is, he's on a <coughs> that's tracking down the perpetrators of this. And then in the background, you have everything unfolding. So we'll follow the cast of characters having to deal and handle all that. And as a teaser, I am probably the only author ever to have written a complex attack, complex military attack on the Camp David facility in Raven Rock. Oh, wow. Um, so I, as far as I know, nobody's ever done that. Nice. I, I'm not going to reveal my source, but I had a retired okay. Green Beret Sergeant Major who had done an assessment on this facility. Okay. Uh, and he's a good friend of mine, and he actually helped me with crafting parts of how you would do it. He said, this oh, is how we would do it. We would do it this way. We drew out the maps. We laid it out. We looked at the pictures. It says, this is how you would execute and move and do this because it's all about funneling to push the person into this position here because the goal isn't to actually well if you can get them on the compound great but if you can't you want to get them into the tunnel because there's a tunnel that connects Certainly. next to raven rock and uh, that's where the then you, you go after that but you know i think i'm the only one who's done that <laughs> we all have a claim to fame i believe that i'm the only action adventure writer who's ever sunken a uh, Chinese freighter in the Panama Canal. I did oh, that in, wow. in book four, The Unending Chase. We, oh, we sank a, a super freighter yeah. inside the Panama Canal in the Miraflores in the lock. locks. In the, lake. Uh, in the locks, in the Miraflores locks. We, we blew the lock doors and uh, we, we sank the freighter right there in the locks, completely shutting down. Uh, of course, fictionally, we had uh, the other side of the locks were under maintenance and couldn't be used. And uh, so we, we essentially shut down the, the entire Panama Canal by sinking a Chinese freighter which uh, uh, again, like you said, we won't give away any secrets, but the freighter wasn't what it appeared to be. And, right. uh, so we built the whole story around this. And I, I believe I'm the only one who's ever intentionally sunk a ship inside the, the Panama Canal for espionage purposes. That is so cool. That is really Great cool. Wayne Stennett says there are no original ideas. Uh, it said everybody's already thought of something. We just get to tell the story differently than someone before us. Oh, that's but, true. I think I think he's he's correct about that. But we we try to do these things that are unique to our writing that, that no one's ever seen before. Yeah, it's neat. And there's so much technology that comes out. You know, to integrate the technology is what makes it more fun too. Because, like in the military side, there's a lot of drone technology that's coming out. There's misinformation, cyber warfare, and psyops. 
but the the drone technology is what's really really unique um, yes. you know and then missile swarms uh, technology because the Chinese the, the Chinese were never part of the uh, the missile um, was that that, uh, that missile treaty between the United States and Russia mm -hmm. so the Chinese were able to develop hypersonic missiles for decades and we were not right a lot of people don't realize like a standard missile for a um, an Arleigh Burke destroyer, you know, most of these missiles, anti-ship missiles usually only have around, you know, 80 to 90 miles, give or take between 67 and maybe 90. And that's it. But a right. Chinese anti-ship missile, let's we'll say it's got three, four, 500 mile range differences. Right. They that can, changes the landscape of warfare when you have those capabilities. Yeah. It's like, you know, an army being equipped with, you know, compound bows. Sure. They're right. pretty deadly at two, 300 meters, but beyond that, they're really not that deadly. Certainly. Um, <laughs> you know, so, you know, it's interesting to see that. So to be able to put those differences in there and kind of do that and, and just the trickery, you know, like uh, you don't have, like one of the ideas I came up with, you have a freighter, these Chinese freighters, you take the tops of them and you, you, you have them covered with cargo, you put them on a track and you retract it and you right. open up the whole bay, but then the bay is filled with these vertical launch tubes for anti-ship missiles. Right. We pack 300 missiles in a freighter. And that freighter, you, you, you have four or five of those freighters operating as a, as a group. Those things could fire enough missiles to overwhelm an entire carrier strike group. Certainly. And, very quickly. Uh, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And what's our defense to that? What are we developing to handle and mitigate something like that? Because this is a poor man's strike group. That right. doesn't cost $12 billion like a carrier. Right. And so, the largest economy in the world has the capability to develop those sorts of things. Correct. So. Correct. Yeah, so it's fun putting it in little little nooks and crannies. Oh, things. sure. But what do you it's have to imagine? What could possibly the human mind is capable of incredible destruction, but we're also capable of an uh, of incredible compassion, and yeah. uh, we we need to need to uh, practice that a little more, in my opinion. Yeah. So speaking of the compassion thing, so two things. One. Um, with our stimulus check, what I did and what I posted on our, our social media pages and everything else like that is I was encouraging everyone to take part of your stimulus check, go to your local store and buy uh, anywhere from 10 to 30 individual things of pasta and 10 to 30 individual things of sauce. And then go and buy diaper size uh, four and five because those are the ones that are always in need and get, a, get six one pack, one week packs of diapers. Um, to just bring to your local food banks. Oh, what a great idea. Yeah. That's yeah. terrific. So we did that with our kids, took the little videos, post the stuff up there, saying, you know, trying to encourage people to do this because my, my local church here, they were feeding 30 to 40 families one week's worth of supply prior to this pandemic. With all the layoffs in the local area, that's, that has now surpassed over 400 families now. To keep oh, wow. Every week. That's yeah. incredible. And so we needed to be able to be cognizant that, you know, with all the lockdowns, with all the people losing their jobs, we got to support these local food banks. We do. And we have to take care of each other. We are, it's so easy to become wrapped up in our own lives and forget to look beyond our own front door. There are so many people who have needs greater than our own. And when we can help, we should. This is That's, easy. This is easy. I mean, it is. Either you could just go to your app and go to, you know, home delivery from Publix. And literally pick it all and have it delivered here and then drive it over to your food bank and, and bring it to them. Certainly. And it doesn't take, you know, doesn't even take an hour out of your day, right. but you provided uh, at least one or two meals for, you know, 20 to 30 families. And then six, and, uh, six families are going to get a week's worth of diapers, which That's is great. pretty, you know. It's, it's incredible the small sacrifices we can make that don't necessarily affect our lives, but can dramatically affect the lives of those who are in greater need. Absolutely. We, and we've been given such a gift as writers. We get to tell stories for a living and there could be no greater job in my opinion than that. And we're rewarded well for that. Um, yeah. When, when our stories begin to sell our economic life changes um, and we have those freedoms to now help others that we could never help before. And to me, that's one of the most rewarding elements of being a successful novelist. Um, yeah. When the world begins to change, uh, inside ourselves, we have the opportunity to then change the world on a much grander scale than we ever believed we could do. And yeah. that to me is the greatest blessing of the financial reward of being a successful novelist. There are so many people we can help 
with so little sacrifice. And uh, that's the, the single greatest thing we can do as humans, in my opinion, is help others. And uh, writing has given us the opportunity to do that. And we love that so much. Uh, we're, I think we're more thankful for that element of the success than anything else. I think so too. And the big thing is people have to remember, you don't have to feel like you have to help everyone. No. You need to help one person. That's right. And one more person and then one more person. You know, like one of my beta readers, he's a retired army colonel, served two years, two, two, uh, two tours in Vietnam as a helicopter pilot and an infantry officer. And, um, you know, he kind of struggled with PTSD a lot through his life, you know, but he, he rose up to be a colonel in the army and, um, you know, and, and he retired and he helped me write a lot of scenes, but then I started encouraging him to, to write his own memoirs. Sure. Uh, and he started doing that. And it's been just awesome. You know, he's, he's now making over four, 4,000 a month on just two books. Oh, that's fantastic on two books. But you know, what was really cool was his wife told me privately that since he started working and doing this with me almost two years ago, it's, it's like totally changed everything for him. Like Good. he's no longer this kind of bitter old man. He's like excited. He's happy. He's energetic. He's wanting to be involved and engaged in doing things. And he's reconnecting with all kinds of old war buddies. Um, That's fantastic. He searches out the stuff for the books he writes. And, uh, you know, it just, it's so changed his life. And just one person at a time, you, you do right. that. And your encouragement sparked that. And it probably changed the lives of everyone around him. Yep. Um, the, a grumpy old man, as you described, uh, affects everyone in the house and everyone in this community. And when his personality and his perspective of the world changes, and he's now happy, somebody who's creating stories and enjoying being alive, that changes how the rest of the world perceives him. And to interact with that person is so much more enjoyable than to interact with the grumpy old man you described. Well, it's exciting because his stories are incredible. And now we get to enjoy them in perpetuity. His sure. sons and his grandkids are going to get to enjoy grandpa's stories and listening to what he went through and what he did. Uh, you know, I mean, his story is incredible. Uh, you know, we got a silver star over there and just what he's done was really neat. Um, you know, he's got a, this newest book, um, Medal of Honor, uh, it's Undaunted Valor, Medal of Honor, it's a volume two. You know, it tells an incredible story of two soldiers who, who got the Medal of Honor 30 days apart from each other, almost essentially in the same battle. And oh. it's an incredible story of heroism. And the third book he's got coming out, Lam Song, is uh, really neat because in this battle, this battle, I didn't know this, but this pitch battle, they have lost over 800 helicopters in a mm. short time span of this battle. Eight wow. helicopters. I mean, it's just incredible to That's hear amazing. stories that took place that we never, we just don't hear about anywhere else. Sure. You know, and those stories would be gone if he didn't write them down. Yes, they'd be gone. One, if he didn't reach out to me to be a beta reader. Two, if we hadn't encouraged him to write his own book. Those tiny little decisions that, that change people's lives forever. Yeah, yeah, I love it. So we got this great charity thing that you're going to participate with oh, us. Yeah. I'm really excited to have you participate with this. Thank you. We're doing uh, the Memorial Day 2020. We're doing a, uh, a charity event where we are basically having 22 authors taking on the 22, which is the veter the 22 veteran suicides a year, or I mean a day that happened. And so we're supporting uh, a number of veteran charities that are specifically designed to help vets get over this. We got the Lone Survivor Foundation that is, uh, they put on family and individual run retreats with specialized counseling to help them deal with this kind of trauma. Uh, we've got the Gary Sinise Foundation, which is going to, which provides the adaptive smart homes for, for folks who are, you know, blind or severely handicapped and they want to be able to function and move and do things, and they, but they got to have a, a smart home that's fit for them and their injury as opposed to just a generic thing. Um, and then uh, Southeastern Guide Dogs, which provides uh, service dogs. Each service dog costs $2,500 uh, to, to raise and train to be given to, to the, uh, that member. I mean, those are really important because if you can, if a service dog can help change the life of this mom or dad that's struggling, right. you're not only going to change them, you're going to change the impact that it's going to have on, those, on their kids. Because 
the kids are are the are so important because they're stuck having to deal with a parent that has PTSD and they don't know why they act the way they do. And they may think their parent doesn't love them or doesn't like them, doesn't want them, and they're going to grow up to have all kinds of psychological problems because of that or emotional problems. Certainly. And if this dog could help prevent that, help right. get over that and deal with that, we're not just solving the problem of dealing with the vet. We're solving the problem of the kids growing up and, and them having a better childhood and a better life. And that's so important to do. It um, truly is. Yeah. So, uh, you know, our goal is to raise $25,000. It was one of the charities, a, a group out of DC that handles uh, homeless vet, homeless uh, veterans and at-risk veterans who are just on the, on the bubble of losing a place or things like that. Um, so we're going to get more information on that last one. Um, but it's just great because our goal is to raise a minimum of $100,000. We want to be able to put $25,000 to each of these groups. We're tag teaming the book with a, a GoFundMe page because some people are going to want to donate more than $10 for the box set. Um, they may want to donate you know, individually through the GoFundMe page. So that way we can raise more money to do it. Our goal is to make this an annual event. So next year, we're going to have our formalized relationships with these organizations. So we'll be able to use their logos. But more importantly, we're going to be able to sponsor specific veterans for specific projects. And really? I think that is going to be awesome. Um, you know, we could say these 15 vets are going to get a service dog. And we're going to make it happen. Here's their story. Here's who they are. And this is the help we need from you to make it work. And same thing when it comes to this particular adaptive home. We're going to commit $100,000 or $50,000 towards this project. We need your help to do that. And we want to make this an annual event, an annual Good. thing. Yeah, so I think it's going to be really, really great. Great, well, great. Please consider, uh, please consider us to be in for the long haul. Oh, yeah. We will help. We'll help any way we can. We will always uh, donate a book for the uh, for the project and uh, anything that anything else we can do to help. We're yeah. certainly more than uh, more than happy to do so. It's a worthy cause. We got great authors in this thing. We got you know oh, yeah. Riddle. We got Douglas Richards. We got Jay and Cheney. We got Brett Battles. I mean, we got some really really top notch authors involved in this set. So I mean, it's it's really good. I think as the years go by, we will draw more and more. Yeah, we will. Because I want to get to a point where we have people beating on our doors to want to get involved in this particular, right. you know, and then I'd like to spawn it to where we have different genres that are, are supporting mm -hmm. it as we can come together as, as an author community and really make a very impactful um, contribution. And we can follow these vets. We can say, you know, we can do follow-up stories to help sure. promote and push it and make it a real effort, a real, a real, thing here so again please please continue or uh, to consider us being in we'll yeah. help any way that we can and, and thank you so much for the invitation to be part of that uh, oh, i'm honored that you would consider my work worthy of being part of such an effort and uh, we're certainly always willing to help yeah no i, I will definitely be reaching out to you because i hear you're really good at facebook ads and while i'm at oh gosh <laughs> well, we're learning <laughs> Uh, we've been, that's been a good avenue for us. Facebook advertising has been very powerful for us. And uh, you seem to be the master of AMS ads. So we're going to have to spend some, some time together off camera and yes. see what we can do to, to work together. All right. Well, it's been a, almost an hour, so we should probably end our interview here. But we will talk again when you've got your next release getting out, because we will definitely promote and push the heck out of that for you. Thank you. That will be uh, May 21st is actually the next one for me. That will be book 10 in the series. Excellent. And, uh, so we're excited about that one. James, right. thank you so much for having me. I very much enjoyed the visit and uh, look forward to spending more time together. Awesome. Appreciate it. We'll look forward to talking to you all later. So tune in next time for the next author.